Wow. What's going on, Brave Conference 2018? I am uh, so honored to be here. Beth did a tremendous job. What an amazing stories and amazing life. Got me convicted. I'm ready to go to Mexico tomorrow myself. And <laughs> I believe I am the first male speaker um, at this event, so there's no pressure. And um, uh, been uh, looking forward to this for a while. Uh, some of my dearest friends in the world uh, work here, right here at Hope Fellowship, and I'm just the biggest fans of the McKenzie family, and aren't you grateful to have amazing pastors? Uh, we, uh, we were flown in today all the way from McKinney, glad to be here. And uh, just a couple of things you need to know about me. I, I am married, my wife is with me, and she's just sitting in the dark, so you can't see her, but you can see her on the screen. And um, I know what you're thinking when you see this. You're thinking, how in the world did he get her? How much did he pay her? Okay, let me explain to you a little bit of our story. About seven years ago, I overheard my wife say to a friend that she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I had no idea what that meant, so I began to guess. I will never forget the very first time that I went to a, a, a resort in San Diego and I walked in and I said, can I speak to your um, wedding person? The lady got smart with me. She said, you mean the wedding coordinator? I said, lady, I'm trying to do something here, okay? Let, just, just, just work with me a little bit. She said, okay, I'll get the wedding coordinator. She, wed, wedding coordinator comes out. She's like, hey, um, so when would you like to get married? I said, um, I don't know. She said, where's your fiance? I said, um, I don't have one. <laughs> and she's like, so what, what, what's your plan? I said, you see, I, it's kind of complicated, but I, I would actually like to propose on the actual day of the wedding. She's like, boy, what are you talking about? I said, you know, I need to work with somebody else that's got a little bit better of a positive spirit, okay? So, um, so uh, long story short, on June 7, 2013, I got down on one knee in Hollywood, Florida, and I said, Amanda Roman, will you marry me? She said, yes. I said, just kidding. Will you marry me today? And uh, we walked into uh, this little lounge, and about 100 of our family and friends were standing in there with a sign that said, today. And uh, we rolled in a dress, hairstylist, makeup artist, everything that you would need to get engaged and married on the same day. We were engaged for 11 hours, okay? So uh, it, it, it was fantastic. So we got married that night. We, we filmed the whole deal. Uh, you can go home and watch it on YouTube, type in the surprise wedding. It's got about 1.4 million views. And, uh, and so that, that's a little bit of our love story. Got engaged and married on the same day. Started having sex right away and had a baby. This is, um, this is Jackson Carter, that's how that works. And uh, he is now uh, three and a half years old and he is a future uh, NBA player and we're super excited about his, about his future. And, uh, but that, that's, uh, that, that's enough. Uh, about me because uh, tonight is about you. And I believe um, that God has sent me here tonight uh, with a mission. And, and I believe he has a, a specific message that he wants uh, you to hear. And I, I believe that there is this woman in the Bible that I think all of us can connect to. And, and she is found in John chapter four. The Bible says this. Now, when Jesus learned that Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well it was about the sixth hour. And then the Bible says this, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. There is a, a, one of the verses that I, I really want you to see is, is the Bible says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Well, first off, you got to know something about Jesus. He's Jesus. He ain't got to do nothing, okay? Like Jesus can do whatever he wants. But when the Bible tells us that Jesus had to pass through Samaria, it wasn't because of travel arrangement. It was because he had a mission for her. Jesus could be anywhere in the world, but he chose to meet a woman at the well. And then uh, the Bible 
It says this, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The disciples at Whole Foods getting a little something, okay? The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. This location is very, very important. Um, this well is uh, an interesting thing, and if you study it in history, um, Jacob's well was a place that women went to in groups. Women love to do things in groups. Want to go to the mall? We're going to go in a group. Got to go to the bathroom? Group project. Okay? Like, like on some level, like, like they love to do things in groups, and what they would do is they would go to this well to draw water at 6 in the morning because it was the coolest time of the day. Yet this woman is at the well at noon where nobody would be there. This woman is avoiding the group. I wonder who's here tonight surrounded by hundreds of women, yet they feel absolutely alone, wishing that they could escape. This is a woman who is sitting at a well and sees an unexpected man. He also is not supposed to be there. Um, a strict rabbi actually wouldn't even be caught speaking to a woman in public. Historians will actually tell you that if a rabbi saw his own mama in public on Mother's Day, he wouldn't even say hi to her, okay? So, like, like he's not supposed to be speaking to her, yet he's engaging in a conversation with this woman. Um, it, historians also note that young men would go to this well early in the morning to pick up a wife. A, little, a, a young dude would go to the well talking about some, hey girl, <laughs> I see you getting that water. Don't make me put a ring on it real fast. I mean like, like this well is special. For this woman to be there at noon gives me the idea that perhaps the woman at the well knows the well very well. Some men would actually go to this well not to just pick up a wife. They would go to pick up a girlfriend for the weekend. This well is, is very special to her and very special to Jesus. Yet he is meeting her at a place of shame. And they begin to have a conversation with what she believes is about water. And on the surface level, uh, it looks like Jesus is going to solve a water problem for her. You're going to get me a Brita? You mean I don't have to come back to the well anymore? This is great. But she doesn't even realize that Jesus isn't offering her water. He's offering her contentment. The one thing that every single person under the sound of my voice longs for. The ability to wake up in the morning and say these words. I'm enough. I have enough. I mean, when was the last time you were actually able to look in the mirror and feel enough? And Jesus is saying, I can give that to you. This woman doesn't realize that the savior of the universe is giving her a one-on-one -on -one illustrated sermon. So Jesus drops the water illustration and just begins to speak to her heart. And he says this. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. This woman's response to Jesus is phenomenal. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You think? I'm pretty sure he's that. 
Jesus is giving us some insight into this woman's world. He is letting us know that this woman has been searching for satisfaction for her soul in a man. That if, if, if I could just get married, then maybe I'll be happy. That maybe if my marriage just, and if I could just, and then she comes to the conclusion, according to Jesus, that maybe the problem isn't me and my husband, but maybe I'll try somebody else's husband. And maybe that will give me satisfaction for my soul. It wasn't a good idea then. It's not a good idea now. Five husbands working on a sixth of somebody else's. Five? Think about that for a moment. That's five weddings. That's five honeymoons. That's five decorated homes. That's five trips to shops at Legacy West. Five rejections, five slam doors, five moving trucks. To say, hey, it's it's over. There are three things that are holding this woman back. Number one, her race. A Jew wouldn't be would dare be caught talking to a Samaritan. Number two, her gender. And now Jesus gives insights into this. Number three, her failures. And isn't it interesting that a lot of times these are the things that can hold us back from being exactly who God has called us to be. This is a woman at a well that is headed down a path that's not very good, except the savior of the universe was waiting for her at noon. Um, as a part of, of the surprise wedding craziness, uh, we did a little bit of a media tour. We got to go on Good Morning America, the Today Show, and, and, and a bunch of various media outlets. And one of the shows we got to go on was the Queen Latifah show. Hey. And so um, <laughs> on this show, my wife surprised me um, on, on the show. And my wife said, hey, Ryan, me and the Queen, because they're friends now, me and the Queen uh, have been working on a little surprise for you, so why don't you go ahead and check out the screen. And on the screen came this guy. His name is Kobe Bryant. Now, some of you might not know who Kobe Bryant is, but I, this, is, this is like, like, like uh, I peed on myself when I saw this, okay? Like I lost my mind, okay? And uh, this is what he said. He said, hey, Ryan, I started to break down Kobe's words like a Bible verse. I said, he said, hey, Ryan. Hey is a term that Americans use to greet their friends. Ryan, that's me. Me and Kobe are friends, okay? Like, like I was losing it. I was losing my mind. I'm like, this, this is insane. And he says, uh, hey, I, wanted, I heard about this wedding you pulled off and wanted to return the favor for your wife. I am extending an invitation to Staples Center. You pick any game you want and just come hang out with the Lakers. I said, honey, you are winning the game. This is amazing. I, like, well, I don't even know what to say. So I had, I had about two months to prepare to meet Kobe Bryant. So I started practicing how I was going to greet Kobe in the shower. Hey, Kobe, it's Ryan. Your voice is too deep, Ryan. Come on, Ryan, get it together. I'm like, okay, what do I wear? Do I, do I wear all gold? Do I wear all purple? Ryan, get it together. Wear normal clothes, dude. And I'm like, okay, he said, hang out. Are we going to get coffee before the game? Is he a latte guy, frappuccino guy? No, 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 no. We'll probably hang out after the game. We're going to go get steak. I'm a generous guy. So I said, okay, like, if we go get steak, do I buy no, he's definitely buying. Okay, so I'm, I'm just losing it. And so I'm going, what are we going to talk about? I can't be an ordinary fan. Like, and I realized the only way that me and Kobe Bryant would have an interesting conversation is if I was in the NBA. So uh, you might not be able to tell from the, where, the depth of perception of where you're sitting, but I am 6'3", 195 pounds, and very good at basketball. Now, I was an All-American in college, but there is a big difference between All-American in college and National Basketball Association, okay? Like, like, it's a huge gap. Nevertheless, I thought, man, wouldn't that be an awesome conversation if we could just talk about work, you know? Like, hey, Kobe, how's the team going? Yeah, mine too. So, so uh, I began to uh, work out and get in tip-top shape, and one of my friends, he who played for the Chicago Bulls. He got cut from the team, and we're playing in Dallas one-on-one. -on -one. I'm 6'3", 195. He's 6'7", 245. And so we start playing one-on-one, -on -one and he beat me every time. And, 
And I began to think, if they cut you from the team, uh, I don't have a chance. And so I did something that I think we all do. Um, I assumed failure. I assumed it. And in that, in that gymnasium in Dallas, I thought, why do we do this? Why are we allowing failure to be the biggest bully in the room? Why, are, why, why would we do this to, to ourselves? How am I giving myself an F on a test I have not taken? It's not fair to me to, to do that. And so that day I, I started this project called Chasing Failure where I ask um, every single person this question. It's what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Like if we just took failure off the table, like what, what, would, you, what would you do? And for me, I, I said, well, I'd be in the NBA. And so I, I just said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start chasing failure because there is this long line of people in our world that are trying to chase success. And you know what every successful person has in common? Failure. So I said, you know what? I'm going I'm to be the first one in the failure line. Like, hey, anybody want to get behind me? This is going to be great. I'm, I'm going to teach people how to fail. Does it make sense? I'm not sure, but it's working a little bit. Okay? So, so I'm like, all right, we're going we're, we're gonna to teach people how to chase failure. We're going to make a documentary about it. It's going to be great. So I meet Kobe, and I say, hey, my name's Ryan, and uh, I'm a filmmaker, and uh, I'm going to... I'm, I'm, I'm doing this documentary called Chasing Failure. I'm going to ask everybody, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And, and, uh, and, and I, I don't think failure should be the bully that we allow it to be. Kobe Bryant, very stern, he just kind of stares at me. He's paying closely attention and he says, yeah, do it. I went, well, I didn't expect you to actually like tell me to do it. Now I actually have to go and do it. So, um, <laughs> I did the thing we all do when we don't know what to do. I Googled it, okay? And so I, um, I'm like, all right, how do I try for an NBA team? And long story short, um, I started emailing NBA teams PR directors one by one. I reached out to the Boston Celtics. I said, hey, you got fans all across the city that are afraid to fail, and I don't think they should be. What if we could take their dreams off the shelf together? What if you believed in this message so much that you would let a complete stranger try out for your basketball team? I probably will fail, but what if I don't? There's only one way to find out. Let me try. Boston Celtics wrote me back in 30 minutes. They said, great story. It's just not for us. I said, well, that's discouraging. They told me no. And then I thought, wait a second. Did the Boston Celtics just email me back? Like, what did you do today? Like, I'm just starting to think about it. Like, <laughs> wait a minute. Like, this, this failure thing ain't so bad. Like, all right, well, one team down, 29 to go. I'm going to make a documentary about all 30 NBA teams telling me, no, it's going to be great. So I just started emailing more NBA teams, and all of a sudden, the Phoenix Suns wrote back, and they said, hey, we love this story. Can you come on Monday? I said, like, uh, like this Monday? Are you serious? Like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, what, what? They're like, yeah, bring your camera crew. I say, yes, me and these people that work for me starting tomorrow will be there on Monday. All right, so I go to the video guy at my church. I say, hey, man, I know we ain't talked in a little bit. Let me holler at you for a second. Um, Hey, man, um, I need a, I need, we got to go to Phoenix on, 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 like tomorrow. You, we're going to have to take off, and me too. He's like, well, we're going to Phoenix. So I said, man, don't be asking all the questions about what we're going to be doing and when we're going to be doing it. Just get on the plane, man. He said, for real, man, what are we doing? I said, man, it's a long story, but I'm trying out for the Phoenix Suns. I'm on. He said, Ryan, what are we really doing in Phoenix? I said, dude, I, I'm serious. He goes, dude, this, this is awesome. Then I had to go to my pastor. I said, hey, man, um, I'm going to have to uh, take a couple days off Monday. I ain't going to be at the meeting on Tuesday. He said, where are you going to be? Uh, I'm going to Phoenix, man. He's like, what, are you speaking out in Phoenix? No, no, no. I'm uh, going to go play basketball. You're skipping our executive meeting so you could go play basketball in Phoenix? Uh, I know I didn't tell you about this because it's about failing and like who wants to do that? And so um, I'm trying, it's a long story, but you know, it's called Chasing Failure. I'm going to Phoenix Suns and trying out for them. I'll be back real fast. He's like, 
what do you mean? Are you going to fail on purpose? I said, no, I'm going to try. And he goes, well, what if you make the team? I said, well, then I'm going to quit. Duh, what do you think I'm going to do? Come back here? I'm done, bro. I'm done. But don't worry, I'm going to fail. Pray for me or don't, whatever you got to do. Long story short, uh, you go home and, and check out chasingfailure.com and you can uh, watch me try out for the Phoenix Suns in about 15 minutes. And uh, it was a two day tryout. And uh, spoiler alert, I failed. That's why I'm here. Okay, so, um, <laughs> but can I tell you that it was uh, two of the greatest days of my life? And here's why I, I didn't believe that God wanted me to be in the NBA, I believe that God wanted me to try. Because in Phoenix is where the fear of failure broke off of my life. And I believe that God desires the same thing for you. There is a drill that I ended up doing. I swear the Phoenix Suns were trying to kill me. I swear they were. I was like, I'm just grateful to be alive right now. And um, I'm doing this drill and I'm embarrassed. I'm gassed. I'm not even running anymore. I'm kangarooing like down. (laughs) It's crazy. And um, And I'm going, Ryan, who, it it felt like the most embarrassing moment of my life and I invited a cameraman to join me. Like, who does this? And so um, I'm feeling very embarrassed in front of these NBA players and I keep going past this logo. Normally when I go past the logo, it's the 24 hour fitness logo. But on this particular Monday, it's the Phoenix Suns logo. And I thought to myself, Ryan, how did you get here? Because you could be at 24 Hour Fitness, but you're here. And I realized this, chasing failure took me further than chasing success ever did. It took me to a place that I couldn't have gone if I was just trying to succeed. There is something magical that happens in your life when you just lose the fear of it. I don't even believe that chasing failure is about winning or succeeding. I believe that chasing failure is about removing the limitations that people have put on their own life. And how the woman at the well story ends, even amidst her five particular failures, is glorious. Here's what happens. The Bible says the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. They have engaged in a conversation about water slash contentment. Then they uh, jumped into a conversation about worship. And it was very theological. And she's going, ah, the Messiah will sort this thing out when when it's all said and done. He'll figure it out. And Jesus says, hey, here's the deal. I am the one you're looking for. I am he. In other words, what he's saying is, is your freedom that you expect to come later is now available to you right now. You don't got to wait till tomorrow. You don't got to wait till your circumstances improve. You can find freedom right now because the Messiah is standing right in front of you. And the Bible says this, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The disciples were afraid of Jesus. They should be. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. And the Bible says this, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed the Savior of the world. God used a five-time divorcee to change an entire city. And here's what he didn't do, that he could have done. He could have said, all right, now, come on, come on, come on, sweetie, let me talk to you for a second. Um, I have a plan for your life, and um, I want to use you to change an entire city. But what I need you to do before you do that is I need you to go break up with your boyfriend. I need you to go change. 
because there's a better version of you that I would like. And, and if, if once you break up, once you break off that relationship that you're not supposed to be in, once you get your marriage together, once you get your life together, once you do that, then we'll send you off to the city and, and you'll change the world. No, he just decided to use her just as she was. Flawed in everything before she changed. And after she changed, I guarantee you that relationship that she was in that she shouldn't have been in would have been a little awkward given her circumstances have now changed. All because she had an encounter with the Savior. All because the Savior came to her on her turf at her place of shame. And he turned it around and made it a place of purpose. Now every time she goes to the well, she doesn't remember the men that tried to pick her up there. Now every time she goes to the well, she just remembers Jesus. Jesus turned this place of failure and made it a place of victory. It's what happens when we encounter the Savior. I got a feeling that there is a woman in this room who has put so many limitations on themselves. And I'm going to ask you one more time. What would you do if you knew that you could not fail? A better question of it is this. What would you do if you knew God was on your side? What would you do? (laughs) This woman went back to the town. People going, Okay, you're telling us about the Messiah. We know who you are. And she's going, I know what you think about me, but it's too late because I have fallen in love with a God that met me at a well at my place of shame, and he turned my life around. So the limitations that you have put on my life and what you think is possible with me, I'm sorry, but I met a different God who absolutely changed my life and when God's on my side it doesn't matter who's against me if there is a book living on the inside of you if there is a clothing line living on the inside of you if there is a blog that is living on the inside of you I came to encourage you to let you know you got to do it why because if God could use her he certainly could use us Father, I thank you so much for each and every woman under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that they would leave this place tonight with so much bravery. That they would know that you are on their side and that you can use them right where they are just as they are.